Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, Accounting for Payroll Protection Program Loan Success. We have Robert Jones here with Left Brain Professionals, and this is a topic that Robert really wanted to reach out and get on the schedule because it's very timely, um, and he has a lot of very timely and actionable information for you. So um, with that, let's just go over our housekeeping items. My name is Liz Brigson. I'll be your host today. Um, to get the most out of the presentation today, um, we'd like to point you in the direction of the GoToWebinar questions pane for live interaction. So if you've had a chance to join us before, you know exactly where to find that. Um, and if you're new here, then you can go ahead over to the GoToWebinar control panel, find the questions bar, go ahead and drop that down and let us know where you're joining from. And we'll just make sure that we can um, see your comments, your questions, your responses, and keep the interaction going throughout. Wonderful. Welcome, Rhonda. Thanks. Rhonda's joining from New York. Also, as part of the GoToWebinar control panel, there's a place where you can download the handouts. There's a lot of really good information, um, so I know you'll want those handouts for future reference. So go ahead on out there, grab those handouts. Today's webinar is one hour, so we'll launch four poll questions. Um, if you'd like to qualify for CPE credit, you can um, respond to those four questions. You'll receive credit for a minimum of three responses, but we'd love for you to respond to all of them. Um, they're very interactive, very timely, so it'll be good to um, all participate in those polls. Um, for those of you who qualify, you'll be able to download your CPE certificate an hour after the conclusion of the event today. If you have any questions about the webinar or CPE credit, you can always reach out to us at support at .com. We're also on LinkedIn, so we'd love if you wanted to find us on LinkedIn, and I'm out there as well, so I'd love to connect with you personally. All right, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Robert Jones. Many of you have probably had the pleasure of working with Robert or attending a webinar of Robert's in the past. He just is a phenomenal pro uh, professional with so much experience in the government contracts and accounting space. He has a master's of accountancy from the College of Charleston. Um, he has spent time in business management roles, compliance roles, operations as a controller, also as a defense contract manager, and he really has invested a lot into being an instructor, a speaker, and hopefully I'm not giving away a secret here, Robert, but I believe you're also working on a book. So definitely a thought leader in this yep. space. So with that, welcome. I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to you. Great, thank you. And uh, just a special uh, thank you again to the uh, Encorsa team and Liz, they've uh, jumped in and helped us out here. Um, as some of you know, obviously the PPP loan is uh, new and ever changing. Uh, we were working fast to try to get some information in your hands and Liz was very uh, accommodating and helpful in making that happen. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick intro. I wanna get into the meat of this today. We've got a lot of information to cover. I expect there to be a number of questions. Uh, as Liz said, please, please, please take advantage of that uh, questions panel. We'll probably save them all till the end. My goal is to uh, uh, shave off uh, 10 minutes or so at the end that we can get into the questions, but uh, go ahead and drop those in uh, as they come to your mind. Uh, really quickly about us, uh, our, again, the firm's name is Left Brain Professionals. We're a boutique accounting firm working only with government contractors. Um, we practice primarily accounting system design, implementation, audit support, uh, some of the types of tasks that we get into with clients are things like indirect rates, getting system approvals, uh, dealing with the incurred cost proposal, and uh, just a quick plug, June 30th is around the corner, folks. Um, if you need help with that incurred cost proposal, please get in touch with us. We can help with that. Um, my picture there, my two other colleagues that do the consulting with me, Melissa and Steve, if you uh, uh, interact with us at any point, you'll probably get a chance to talk to one or both of them as well. Uh, really quickly here, you can email us as well. Any of your questions, whether it's about this or other topics, support at leftbrainpro.com. Uh, you can find us on social media. Uh, again, drop your questions in there. If we don't get to all of them today, we will get back to you. If a question comes to you later, uh, again, that support at leftbrainpro.com is an excellent way to get a hold of us. So what are we going to talk about today? Oops, I clicked uh, too quickly there. And our, I talk fast anyway on these things, and I feel the need to talk fast uh, even more so today. I apologize. Again, there's just a lot of really good stuff happening here that we need to talk about. Uh, in this particular program. We're gonna talk a little bit about the details of the PPP loan, uh, which is the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, I'll describe the loan application process, 
the meat of what I really want to get into is this third bullet here of the accurately calculating the requested loan amount. Um, and, uh, and a spoiler alert, if you didn't watch the news, uh, the SBA is out of money for this program as of right now. Uh, the Democrats and Republicans, not to be partisan at all, but the Democrats and Republicans, as you can imagine, are fighting and arguing about what the next phase is going to be and how it's going to come together. Um, unfortunately, if you have not applied uh, yet, uh, there are no funds. The banks are not taking any more applications. SBA is not accepting anything else from the banks. They're not accepting any new banks into the program. Uh, and I would also say that if you applied in the last couple of days, that it's possible, maybe even probable or likely that your loan will not be uh, approved or funded. A um, lot of unknown around that at this moment. Uh, we will talk about the loan forgiveness because that's obviously a big part of the PPP and uh, one of the main reasons a lot of people are getting involved. And we'll talk about the documentation requirements. That's gonna be uh, a part that gets people uh, in trouble, I think, um, with this. And uh, we'll give you some best practices for success uh, in making the most out of this program. With that, a quick disclaimer here. Um, this presentation is not intended to be tax or legal advice for any specific situation. Really, really important to point that out as we talk about this particular topic today. The facts of every situation and every organization vary. Um, so contact your accountant or attorney to discuss your specific situation. They're the ones with the uh, that are going to be able to help you the most. Uh, the other thing that I would tell you here is this presentation um, is meant to be a little bit thought-provoking uh, and help, uh, hopefully helpful to you. Uh, there may not be a single right or wrong answer uh, for any specific business entity as we go through this. Uh, with that in mind, Liz, I'd like to go ahead and kick off the uh, first question here, which I think is uh, uh, key with the fact that we just learned uh, the SBA is out of money. So, uh, uh, jump in there and, and fill out the questions uh, or fill in your answer. Uh, have you already applied for a loan? Yeah, so my video feed's not on, but my jaw dropped when you said that the <laughs> money is already out. Um, $349 billion with a B is gone in less than two weeks. That is astonishing. So It, it is astonishing. Um, look, looks like those responses are coming in pretty quickly. Um, and so far we're seeing about 16% of you actually have the money in hand. So I'm um, glad to know we have some and, joiners who were able to get their hands on that. Yeah, we actually, we got noticed yesterday that one of our clients um, got, they haven't received the funds, but they got the approval and they were working out the final details on receiving the funds from their bank. Uh, I can see the poll responses there. Um, I'm really curious about the 49% who said they don't need or don't qualify. Uh, if you throw some information in the chat or the question box, that'd be really helpful. I'm just curious to know either uh, maybe why you don't need it or why you think you don't qualify. And again, unfortunately, uh, for those that either said no, um, you're still working on the application or that uh, you're in that last bucket, there's a big chunk there. Uh, unfortunately, that money, at least for now, is gone. We don't know uh, if and when and how much more money uh, will become available uh, in the program. All right. So let's talk a bit about some of the details. I don't want to get too caught up in this. Um, I think there are plenty of other webinars and information out there. Uh, I will say as well, we've put a couple of blog posts on our website. Um, so go out there to leftbrainpro.com. You'll see the answers blog up there in the uh, top menu, click on that. We've got some links to the information out there uh, for you as well. But basically, uh, following entities um, that are affected by the COVID-19 may be eligible. Um, any small business that meets uh, the SBA size standards, um, and again, those can vary a little bit, um, be, uh, any 501c3 nonprofit organization, that does include religious organizations, which has uh, caused a little bit of an uproar for some people. Uh, again, not to be political, it doesn't matter which side you're on, but it is a, an interesting topic out there um, in today's world. Veterans organizations, tribal business uh, concerns um, as well, uh, as long as they have 500 or few employees, and again, or if they otherwise meet the SBI, SBA size standards, uh, if they are more than 500 employees. 
We do know that the food uh, and service uh, industries, those hotels, are these people have been hard, hard hit in all of this. There were some exceptions that were made to the size standards. Um, so they can have more than 500 employees as long as they have less than 500 in any one physical location. Interesting little note, we live in an apartment complex. There are actually three complexes that are here together. Uh, and uh, the owners here have gone together, partnered with our local food truck association. And so we have food trucks showing up out here in the parking lot several days a week. So I don't know what's happening in your world. Um, it might be one way. If you, if you have a way to uh, influence that, you might consider how you can bring uh, food trucks out to your neighborhood um, and try to help those uh, folks along. Uh, back to the topic here, sole proprietors, independent contractors, and self-employed people are eligible. Uh, you do need to apply separately. Uh, so for example, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, if you are a company that otherwise employs an independent contractor, if you've got some 1099 people, you as the business cannot count them for your payroll costs, but they are eligible otherwise on their own to apply. Um, so important piece of information there. How can you use the money? So there were some clearly identified, well, huh, I say somewhat jokingly clearly identified. There were some black and white answers about uh, what the authorized expenses are, and we'll go through those. Unfortunately, there's some terms in here that were not clearly uh, defined. Um, and so I think that that's one of the things that's going to cause some confusion in this program. So we know the payroll costs, right? The, the name of the program is the Payroll Protection Program, uh, right? So obviously payroll costs are in here. Healthcare benefits and insurance premiums, and we'll dig into the payroll cost details in a moment, uh, but healthcare benefits and insurance premiums, the interest portion of mortgage payments. So interest portion only. Um, keep in mind that when you make that mortgage payment, right, with, and again, whether you're a business owner um, or if you're at home and you're trying to understand right mortgage payment, every time you write that mortgage, remember a portion of that goes to the principal. And if you're early in your mortgage, a significant amount of that monthly payment goes to the principal. And then there's a portion that goes to interest. And it's only the interest portion um, that, uh, that can be paid with the funds here. So you can't pay principal and you cannot make any prepayment. Uh, of any kind either. Rent, uh, utilities, and then if you took out an EIDL loan, uh, which is an economic injury disaster loan, that's a regular type of disaster loan that was already available through the SBA. Um, that was expanded in the first quarter of this year to deal with the COVID-19. Um, if you took out one of those specific loans between January 1st and April 3rd of this year, you can roll that into your PPP loan. If you have other EIDL loans, those are separate. They remain separate and are not part of this. So let's talk about what payroll costs include. Um, so salaries, wages, commissions, um, other compensation payments. Uh, in one of the earlier drafts, and what you may have seen early in the process is at one point they did talk about 1099 payments. Those were later specifically excluded, okay? So if you have 1099 people, um, you cannot count, cannot count them into your payroll cost. Um, payments of a cash tip or equivalent, right? So again, if we think about the um, service industry, that's a, a very common practice. Uh, if you have paid vacation, parental, medical, family leave, note in parentheses there, again, very important. Um, this would be separate than any of those credits that are allowed under the FFCRA or the Families First Coronavirus um, uh, response act. Now, uh, this is to prevent double dipping. We're not getting into the details um, of those uh, other programs in the FFCRA. We could probably do webinars all day long to cover each of them. Um, if you need help with that, talk to your tax accountant. Uh, they can help you through that process, uh, but that is specifically uh, excluded uh, from uh, the PPP stuff here. Uh, an allowance for dismissal or separation uh, can be included, uh, as well as the payment for the provision of group health benefits, including premiums and retirement benefits. So if you have a 401k, you have a SEP or a SIMPLE, um, if you are regularly otherwise making payments to those, and, um, then those uh, count as your payroll costs as well. And then what we refer to as SALT or state and local taxes uh, on compensation of employees. 
Note that we did not talk here, and I'm going to get to the exclusion. One of the things in the exclusion uh, is the exclusion of FICA or that Social Security and Medicare. Um, that's going to be uh, B here, but let me do A really quickly. Um, if you have employees who make in excess of $100,000, the portion in excess of $100,000 is excluded. So you can include everything up to $100,000. Anything in excess of $100,000 is specifically excluded. Uh, the employer and the employee's portion of FICA uh, and railroad retirement taxes, and again, FICA is that uh, uh, Medicare, Social Security stuff. Um, any compensation of employees whose principal place of residence is outside of the U.S. So I know that we have um, uh, a client that actually has a mixture. They have some uh, employees who are employees uh, that are U.S.-based, and they have employees that are foreign-based. So in their particular situation, only the employees who are U.S. based, uh, that's the only compensation that could be used uh, for this calculation. Again, excluded. I mentioned it uh, when we were uh, a couple of moments ago, but qualified uh, sick leave wages and the family leave wages uh, that you may qualify for under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Those are specifically excluded. All right, uh, some important detail, um, and this is where some of the language and stuff gets really interesting uh, in, the, um, uh, in the guidelines. There is not a requirement to use a specified percentage of the funds for payroll costs. You might say, but wait, I heard about this 75%. Yes, however, right, the, the button, the tuxedo here, however, at least 75% of the PPP loans uh, do need to be used for payroll costs if you're going to go for the forgiveness aspect. And we're going to talk about the forgiveness uh, provisions uh, of the program here in a little bit. Um, all right, so what is interest? Again, we want to break down some of these uh, more details of, of what these uh, uh, authorized or allowable costs are. So interest portion of a mortgage obligation. Uh, reminder, I said it before, it's the interest portion only, not the principal. Uh, the regulations state that it's any debt incurred in the ordinary course of business that is a liability to the borrower is a mortgage on personal or real property. And that's really important information right there. And was incurred before February 15th. If you took out a loan uh, to buy equipment or a vehicle on February 16th, it doesn't qualify. If you took out a loan prior to that, again, on real or personal property, then it's includable. Um, it's um, some ideas here. Again, a mortgage on a building, a vehicle loan, equipment loan. Important note, credit cards and lines of credit are not mortgage. The lines of credit is still a little bit squishy. Uh, we're waiting for additional guidance here. Um, but generally, lines of credit are not tied to a collateral. If you happen to have a separate line of credit um, or some other type of loan, that is collateralized potentially by inventory. Uh, in that type of situation, then it, the interest on that may qualify, but credit cards are what we refer to as unsecured debt, right? You can go buy anything with them, could be a service, could be, you can buy, go buy meals with them, you can buy hotel nights, right? All kinds of stuff you can spend your credit card on, um, but it's not secured in any way by any kind of property. So because of that, the interest on those credit cards would not qualify. The lines of credit, I would say if you have a generic line of credit that you use potentially to, you know, fund payroll between big invoices or things like that, probably not going to qualify um, because they've said that the, the mortgage needs to be tied to property of some fashion. So what is a rent obligation? Um, again, unfortunately, this is one of those spots in the regulations where they were not clear on a definition of what constitutes rent. Uh, I think, and, and in reading, and I will tell you, I have read and read and read, I don't know what you guys have been reading. I've been reading a lot of information on this PPP loan, uh, and, and many of us are saying a lot of the same things. We wish there were better definitions of some of this stuff, <clears throat> because this says a rent under a lease agreement. Okay, what if I have leased equipment? What if I have leased vehicles in my organization? Do those qualify as rent? The answer right now is unclear. Uh, that was one of the things I, I meant to add to the disclaimer uh, slide in the beginning. Uh, one of the things to 
that you're going to have to be aware of and that's going to be frustrating to all of us is there are a lot of things that are unclear. Uh, we're giving you the best information that we can. Um, and again, I, providing you stuff that I found last night and this morning as I was continuing to update this. Um, check back regularly, whether it's with us, whether it's with your SBA lender, your bank, whoever is helping you through this process. Um, go back and continue asking questions uh, because uh, we're hoping that SBA comes out and answers these things. We think the rent obligation was intended for things like a building or an office, right? You're renting a warehouse, you're renting your office space. That would be pretty straightforward. Again, whether you have, if you happen to have a lease for equipment or vehicles, that is, I'll say, unclear at best at the moment. <clears throat> uh, related party rent, um, interesting note here for my government contractors out there, we always have that conversation about related party rent. For the provisions of the CARES Act and the PPP loans, there doesn't seem to be any exclusion for related party transactions, okay? Um, however, and I put this note out here, however, for those of you who are government contractors, there are still related party rent issues that are addressed in FAR 31205-36. Very, very important um, to stay on top of it from that aspect. Again, for the terms of the CARES Act and the PPP, um, there doesn't appear to be any particular issues with related party rent uh, that we can see right now. So what is a utility payment? Um, uh, it's nice that they expanded that to include things like telephone and internet. Uh, but again, they've given you a pretty, I think this is a pretty uh, clear list, right? So if you, I've seen utilities, you elect uh, electricity, gas, water, sewer would be in there. And usually when you pay your water bill, you're paying your sewer with that. Um, telephone and internet access. Again, all of these accounts have to be in place before February 15th. If you moved into a new office on February 17th or February 20th, unfortunately, those things are not going to qualify. Okay, that's going to be another um, interesting sticking point um, uh, in this process. When I get to the documentation stuff at the end, you're going to hear me say, I'm going to say it now, document, document, document. That is going to be the thing that is going to be very helpful uh, for your success in this program. <clears throat> All right, Liz, let's kick off a, uh, another poll there, and I'm going to give my voice uh, a couple of seconds of rest. Okay, that sounds great. So our second poll is, um, love to hear about why you are applying for a payroll protection program loan. So um, go ahead and respond to that poll. Robert, we're having a ton of really great questions come in. So we'll try to get to some of them now and Hopefully we'll have some time at the end. So you had just talked about rent and one of the first questions came in from Anna about rent. So in this particular instance, um, could you use a payroll protection loan for parent company rent? So let's say the subsidiary company doesn't have rent expense on their books, um, but the parent company, which owns the sub 100%, they have the rent, the utilities, loan interest, and all of that. Um, is that kind of an unknown gray area or were you able to determine one way or the other on that topic? I'm going to guess that the, based on the way the question was worded, that it was the child company that applied for the loan. If that yeah. is the case, I would say the rent of the parent company would not qualify unless the, the I, I, there'd have to be some kind of agreement, uh, cost sharing agreement or some kind of application um, I would say let's chat about that. That's going to be one of those that's definitely going to be a little squirrely to figure out. Okay. But an excellent, excellent question. Yeah. Definitely. We're going to go ahead and probably about this whole five more seconds and we'll go ahead and close it down. Um, it does look like about half the audience um, said, hey, this would really help with cash flow. And they think that, you know, the program is designed for that. Um, there are a few of you who it looks like this money really is serving as a lifeline. And, yep. uh, and uh, what do you think about, so purple and yellow here, I, I think that this, this is kind of one of the unknowns, right, with the personal side of the funding that came through, it's like everyone received it. For the payroll protection program, my understanding is that it's really designed for companies who can specifically demonstrate a need, but at the same time, like, we're paying taxes, there's money going out, it's hard to 
pass on money and funds that are being made available. It kind of creates an ethical so the, it, it is. It's, it's actually a very interesting um, conversation. And, and you're right. I think it's an ethical conversation uh, uh, there. Um, I, I will say that some of the early uh, talk around the program was that there was going to be a requirement to show, right, that you were financially impacted. Those were those provisions were removed. Um, so those provisions do not exist in the program right now. You know, will we potentially see that in the next version of the program? I, I don't know. Uh, again, that's the only thing I can tell you is stay on top of the news. Um, you know, check back with us. Check back again with your other lenders, accountants, whoever you're working with. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about the loan application process because I really want to get into the math stuff and show you that uh, and again save that time at the end for some questions. Contact your bank. Um, you know, if you're dealing with one of the major banks, you, uh, we use Chase. Um, we actually applied for a loan ourselves uh, and went through the process, uh, went right into the Chase website. I will say it was generally pretty easy to do through Chase. Um, talking to some of our clients, it was fairly easy for them to do as well. Uh, the only thing is that the bank has to be an existing SBA uh, 7A lender, which means they're used to giving out um, the SBA loans. And if you're dealing with a, uh, even regional, a number of your regional banks and your credit unions uh, were already qualified, uh, so it's likely that the bank you were already dealing with uh, could probably have helped you. Uh, if you do need help, um, we've got a link here. You can get this link directly off of the SBA website as well. Uh, I think when you go to the page uh, for the SBA PPP loans, it's one of the first big buttons up there. It says find a lender. Uh, you type in your zip code and it'll pop up and give you all the banks in your area that are already qualified. Uh, so I'm you know, going to kind of flow through, fly through this here. Pretty straightforward. You're going to need, you know, legal name, entity structure, the address, email, uh, phone number, contact kind of information citizenship uh, of the owner and you will need to have you will be required to list uh, all of the owners so if you're in a situation that there are multiple owners of the business you will need all of their information um, to enter um, that average monthly payroll we're going to get into the math i won't get into that here um, but you will need that uh, average monthly payroll to fill out the application if you have an outstanding EIDL loan, and remember it has to be one that was a, that you got between January 1st and April 3rd of this year. If you have one of those and it's outstanding, you can roll it into the PPP and you will need that information. Uh, you'll need your, uh, your annual business revenue, ownership dates of the business. Uh, again, one of the key things is about keeping people employed. So they wanna know how many employees that you currently have how many jobs are going to be created uh, by receiving the loan or how many jobs will be retained. Um, one of the things that I didn't get into this webinar, because again, I was trying to figure out how much, what was important and what could we uh, cover in 60 minutes. Uh, keep in mind that one of the calculations when you do go apply for forgiveness, is they're going to ask for specific documented information that you maintained or um, actually added employees. If you have more than a 25% drop in full-time equivalents, what we refer to as FTEs, if you have more than a 25% drop in FTEs or uh, a more than a 25% drop in wages to employees, so let's say you cut their uh, salaries so you could at least keep them employed but at a lower salary, if either of those drop uh, more than 25%, um, you will be disqualified from full forgiveness. So that's going to be one of the things um, that's going to be key in here. Uh, and then this is where it got really interesting, um, and I'm going to show you when I, because uh, I am going to switch and show you. We built a calculator online. I've also got an Excel spreadsheet to show you. Um, it's about how you're using the loans. So when you, at least hours, and I know talking again to some of our colleagues and some of our clients, they ran into the same thing. Uh, when you went into the application and asked for that average monthly payroll, you punched that in, and then it told you it multiplied by two and a half. And it said, okay, this is your maximum loan amount that you qualify for. So then it says, okay, now how are you going to use the funds? Then you had to enter detailed information about how you're going to use the funds. And that had to match up to how much money you were requesting. That's one of the disconnects that I'm going to show you the math on um, in the program. So you do have to break down how you're going to spend the money in terms of payroll costs, your rent, your utilities, the mortgage interest, 
uh, again, group health care benefits, including retirement. Um, and so I want to get into uh, here's where I get a chance to get into the fun math. I'm an accounting nerd. You can probably hear it in my voice. This stuff really does uh, excite me. I'm going to try to switch to my Excel. Um, Liz, if you'll let me know that everybody sees this correctly. Yeah. Are you guys yep, seeing my Excel? Well. Okay. Great. Um, so what I did here, I'm not going to bore you guys too much with the Excel. Give me a second to, uh, there we go. I, I gave a couple of different uh, scenarios here. I just plugged some numbers in. Um, you know, so these, these are fictitious numbers, um, but I think fairly representative of, of what a small firm of, of, you know, four to six people might be. Um, you're going to need to capture this payroll cost. So, again, what are payroll costs? Uh, and this is the front end of the calculation. So we're just trying to figure out what are your average payroll costs. You need a 12-month period. It can be um, the 12-month period of uh, the last three quarters of 2019 and the first quarter of 2020. Um, it could have just been all of 2019. Uh, if you're a seasonal employer, there are some other options out there. I didn't get into the details of that in here. Um, knowing that at least the base of our clients are not seasonal in nature, but if you are a seasonal employer and have spikes, there are some other calculations available to you. Um, but basically, again, 12 months. So I've got a spot here to enter what 12-month period you used. Um, you know, when we talk about our government contractors, most of you should be used to seeing the terminology and the way, we're, the way we break out stuff here. Your COGS, overhead, and G&A labor. Compensated absences. Again, this is excluding anything that you might be asking or claiming for under the FFCRA. So these would be, this would have been your normal compensated absences. PTO, vacation, sick, holiday, whatever you call it, however you break it out, that goes in there. Uh, the SALT, again, is state and local taxes. Uh, workman's comp. Uh, workman's comp is probably a questionable one. Wasn't really clear. We included it. Um, it is a required basically group, a, a type of group health benefit. Um, wasn't clear to include it or excluded. We included it for our argument here. Uh, retirement <clears throat> was mentioned, obviously health insurance, dental insurance. And then remember I said you have to back out the wages of anything over $100,000. So what you would do is you would run your, uh, and for example, when I was doing ours, right, we just pulled our income statement uh, plug in the information, um, validate it to numbers, and and then, you know, okay, who makes uh, more than $100,000? Find out that number and subtract it out because that cannot be included to get on the front end. That gives you your annual um, total, and then obviously if that's for 12 months, then you divide by 12 because what your monthly average is here. Times 250%, right, because that's the, the magic number, so times 2.5. If you had an outstanding EIDL, I threw one in here for argument's sake. Um, we did not have one. None of our clients had one. Um, one of the stipulations, though, is if you had one of those EIDLs and you got the $10,000 advance, um, that was already a grant and excluded. Again, if you have an outstanding EIDL, please talk to somebody to make sure you're calculating this properly. I will tell you that I found some other online calculator tools for the PPP. So if you go out there and Google PPP calculator, uh, PPP loan calculator, you'll find some other tools out there. I will tell you that I found some errors in the way some of those calculators were built, um, and particularly around the EIDL. They were not properly calculating the EIDL stuff. So anyway, again, you get your monthly average multiplied by two and a half, whether or not you have an EIDL. So for example, if I just go here and take it out for argument's sake and what we're doing, this tells me what my total loan amount um, is. What I did is calculate and said, okay, if, if my goal is to get forgiveness out of this and I know that I have to spend 75% spend of my money on labor, am I going to achieve that, right? Because that's gonna be one of the keys. And I think this is one of the things where a lot of people fell short. Uh, and we've got a quiz, or I shouldn't say quiz, we've got a polling question coming up soon. Um, so be thinking about it, I'm gonna ask you now, how many of you calculated your uh, estimated expenses, and when I finish this here, um, some of you may have an aha uh, in this, but how many of you actually calculated your um, expenses to make sure that you were going to exceed, uh, meet or exceed the 75% requirement uh, for payroll expenses to get their forgiveness? You'll notice in my example here, 
My forgiveness of 75% is $68,500. My estimated expenses for payroll in this particular situation was $71,000. So it does look like, in this case, if the um, estimated expenses all come out to be true, then um, I should, you know, in, in my sample here, I should qualify uh, and be able to get the full uh, forgiveness. You do have to include, um, again, you can only spend the money on these certain things in order to get forgiveness. Could you, in theory, otherwise spend the money on other stuff? Yes, you could, but you wouldn't qualify for forgiveness. Let's be clear. Um, so let me say that again. If you get the loan, can you spend it on things other than this? Yes. Yes, you can. Will you qualify for forgiveness? No, or at least not all forgiveness. If your, your forgiveness will be prorated based upon how you spend it if you don't meet this basic 75% requirement and if you spend it on stuff other than these allowable costs. So keep in mind, you could potentially spend that money on other stuff, but then that's going to affect how much of the loan would be forgiven, okay? So our focus here was let's try to get 100% forgiveness. How do we do that? Well, now we got to look at what our other monthly expenses are because this is one of the tricks in the calculator on, I shouldn't say in the calculator, in the application online, you enter this $36,000 over here online in, the, uh, in your bank's uh, online application. It tells you what your maximum loan amount qualifies for, 250%, so it's $91,000. Then it says, okay, how are you going to spend that money? So you come over here and you've entered your estimates. You enter how much your rent, utilities, and other stuff is for that eight-week period. I'll get into some of the math discrepancies here in a moment. Um, this says, hey, wait a minute, your total use of loan all of a sudden is only $77,000, not $91,000. So that means in this case, if you took out the $91,000 and your actual expenses turned out to be what your estimate is here, you'd be in a situation that you had um, 13000 almost $14,000 uh, in money that would not be forgivable. Okay, don't know if you see over here on the lower left-hand corner, um, I put a little calculation and said how much of this would be forgivable and how much would not be based upon this scenario. So what we did, and what we advised some clients to do was to, if, if you know this, if you really know that you're only going to spend $77,000 and your intent is to maximize the forgiveness, then you need to calculate what your new monthly average is, right? So take that number and divide by two and a half because that's going to be the magic number. And so that, this new number down here, my new adjusted monthly average then is what I would enter online in my bank's um, application so that they would say I would be qualified for 77524 I get that much money. I spend it exactly as I say up here and do these things. I meet the requirements. I got all the documentation. Then I should, I have to be clear, right? Then you should qualify for 100% forgiveness at that time. Um, you see, I've got multiple tabs in here, a couple of scenarios that I just wanted to show. Some of this is going to, some of the quirkiness may come in depending on whether you pay biweekly. I don't know if anybody's paying semi-monthly. I guess that I didn't put a poll question in. If anybody actually is paying anything other than biweekly or biweekly, throw something in the Q&A or in the chat. I'd love to see how many people are, is anybody still paying semi-monthly? Uh, I doubt anybody's paying monthly anymore. I, th I think some universities and stuff pay monthly, but I don't know if many uh, industry uh, employers are paying monthly anymore. Oh, somebody said monthly. Hey, I'd be curious to know who you work for. And somebody said uh, semi-monthly. So let me do that really quickly. Let me show you. Interesting little thing. And this is where there's a discrepancy in the uh, regulations, how this was written and how um, the calculation was determined. Did you catch that the um, uh, qualification on the front end is based on a monthly average? but that your estimation and the period that's covered by the loan is, is counted in weeks. And you might look at that and say, well, eight weeks sounds like two months, right? We all typically say there's four weeks in a month, so eight weeks would sound like two months. Does anybody else understand that eight weeks is not two months? That two months on average is actually 60.9 days, 60.8 and some change. If you go to my blog, um, I've got all the math out there and got into some details of it. But, but two months is actually 60, almost 61 days. So that means eight weeks is 56 days. So your average on the front end was based on an extra four point, some change days, uh, 4.8 days additional. 
So if you did nothing else and just simply went in here and, and um, uh, calculated an average for your weeks and compared that to the average for your month, you would likely end up, and I actually can show you the math separately, you would end up in a situation where you would not spend enough money in payroll to cover it. Um, there's a discrepancy in how that was calculated. We have not seen any indication that they're going to clarify that discrepancy. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Again, we don't know what the next version um, of this is going to be. Are they simply going to put more money into the existing program? Is there going to be a PPP version two? We don't know what the future looks like. Um, but this is why calculating this stuff, um, getting the report, staying on top of this, I would tell you, if you have applied and, you ex and you've either got the money or you're expecting to get the money, um, you're staying on top of this, folks. Do not let this slide because um, you want to make sure that you're on target to get your forgiveness out of this. For my semi-monthly person up there, Jim, I saw, I think it was you that said you had to pay semi-monthly. I just wanted to show really quickly, the dollars on the left-hand side remain the same. Uh, it's the dollars on the right. So my payroll cost for the last year was the same. If you look here in this row, you'll see I've got some information on pay periods. So I've got 24 pay periods, right? That's how many I would have in a semi-monthly situation versus if I was bi-weekly, I would have 26 that you see here. Um, and in theory, I would probably only have four, technically I have four point and some change. So this is one of the other things that is not clear in the regulations. Um, is, do you have to have actually have paid these expenses? Is accruing them sufficient? Um, uh, there's some debate about that. We would generally tend to think that right businesses who, who are accrual-based businesses, um, they would recognize that expense, uh, even if it's not paid. Uh, they would recognize that it would be on the books in an accrual fashion, and so it should otherwise qualify. We believe that will be true. Um, but there are some little quirks here, um, again, in the math and how this plays out. Two other quick quirks that I want to show you. Um, what if you're in a situation where maybe you ramped up in the first quarter of this year, or maybe even near the end of 2019? When you did these, um, in the case here, uh, I said my numbers were from 1-1 of 2019 to 1231 of 2019. If you had a ramp up at the end of 2019 or the beginning of 2020, that could potentially skew in your favor, I mind you, it actually could be in your favor of being able to, in the, in the scenario that I gave here was, yeah, even though, um, uh, even though I qualified for $91,000 on this scenario here and to get the, uh, well, let me do this. Let me take. I was playing around with the. Uh, give me a second. Let me take out the VIDL stuff because most people don't have that. I would say. Um, if I otherwise qualified for the ninety-one thousand dollars here, my forgiveness in this scenario, and this is my ramp up scenario, as you can see there, my forgiveness uh, amount is still the same of sixty-eight thousand. But because I ramped up and I actually had higher expenses in the first quarter and into the second quarter of this year, me and my ability to meet the forgiveness is not a problem. However, this is where I think there's going to be the real problem for a number of uh, companies out there. What if you're in a ramp down situation already? What if, and I think many of us can agree that 2019 was an excellent year for many of our businesses. Um, you know, it was a great economy. There were a lot of people doing well. What if you were paying a lot of overtime in 2019? You had an excellent year delivering a lot of stuff, but you were paying overtime. And let's say that on average, maybe you had 10% of overtime across the board. That wouldn't be an unrealistic situation for a number of companies out there. Well, obviously, if all of a sudden this year you're not working, even if you're keeping people on board. So maybe you've taken those employees, you're keeping them, but you've switched them to overhead. You're doing something so you can at least keep a paycheck in their hands, even if they're not necessarily working um, or they're not able to do billable work or direct work for your clients. You're keeping them on the payroll. You're probably not paying overtime to do that, right? You're probably just trying to keep their basic paycheck in their hands. Um, now, all of a sudden, you're not paying that overtime, and you end up in a situation potentially where, uh, let me take out my EIDL again in this scenario. You end up in a situation where now, all of a sudden, and it looks close, um, but you're still $2,300 off in my scenario here. Now, you're potentially under 
uh, the forgiveness threshold of being able to get, again, I have to be clear, of being fully forgiven. You can end up in a situation on various things, uh, and we're waiting for more details from SBA, uh, where there could be partial forgiveness on stuff. But certainly, if you don't meet these basic um, requirements, you certainly will not uh, qualify for full forgiveness um, in this scenario. With that, let me um, give me just a second here. I didn't mean to pop up Teams. Let's get. Uh, uh, we've got a link um, that will be available in the follow-up email, and uh, as well as if you want to pop that out there for people to click on now. If you just go to our website, leftbrainpro.com, I just want to show this really quickly. I want to get through a couple more things and get to the q and I see lots of really good questions. If you come to our website, click on that tool. There's a PPP loan calculator. We've got two versions out here, just so you know. I've got some information at the top explaining that. Um, so I've got what I call the estimated formula. So what it does is you enter your actual information for your 12-month period. You tell me what your pay periods are. And then it uses an average to figure out what your estimate is. You're going to have to fill in, see all these blanks. You'll fill in the information. It's going to calculate this for you right on the fly. You can uh, print a copy of it. Um, you can enter your uh, information and get it emailed, get a copy of it emailed to you. I saw somebody said a question, can I download the calculator? Yes. Right there, we've got an Excel version right there that you can uh, download. Um, you know, we do ask for your email address and name. Uh, so we can follow up with you on that. The one online you can use for free. Um, we don't get any information on that, but if you want to download, you can get the um, Excel version. All right, with that, let me get back to the uh, PowerPoint slides and let's get through this stuff here. So I'm just going to go through this. I showed you in real time, but just a quick reminder, you're going to have to identify those uh, payroll costs over 12 months. You'll calculate that average monthly payroll. If you have an EIDL, right, that's, remember that's the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, um, a separate loan program under the SBA. If you have that, you'll add in that information. Um, if you got the advance through that, you want to, that's going to determine your loan amount. Remember, upfront, basic information multiplied by two and a half to, determines your loan amount. However, calculate that 75% threshold and then estimate your uh, eight weeks of expenses um, and figure out, are you going to uh, spend all of the money and be above um, the threshold. And that includes right there, number 10, getting those other authorized expenses in there. That's the rent, uh, utilities, interest, and stuff like that. And then figure out, you know, do you have to, should you enter an adjusted payroll amount um, so that you don't get more money than uh, you're able to qualify for the forgiveness? It's not a bad thing. Now, to be clear, you can still get the money. You can spend it on other stuff. Even if it's not fully forgiven, it just uh, stays as a regular loan. You make the payments. you got two years to pay it back. The first payment is not for six months, and it's 1% interest. I mean, that's a heck of a deal. Quite honestly, if you didn't, um, you know, use this money for all the stuff that's out here, um, you know, a two-year loan, 1% interest is a, is a pretty sweet deal uh, for getting some money. All right. Um, Again, on the loan, on your lender applications, uh, for those of you who applied, probably already saw this. Unfortunately, we saw uh, at least of the ones on the um, on the webinar today that about half of you have not applied for different reasons. Um, hopefully, that window opens back up and everybody gets an opportunity. Uh, but keep in mind that you will need to tie out uh, your use of the funds to the total loan amount. Uh, I already mentioned the caution of the if you if you use somebody else's online calculator, just understand that there are some errors out there. The other thing that I noticed that people, and I tried to break ours out to be clear, as I broke out like rent, utilities, health insurance, I tried to give you pointers so that you captured all the appropriate stuff. Um, some of the other calculators that I saw just had one line for payroll expenses. They're just assuming you know all of what goes in there and plop it in there. I tried to break ours out to make it a little clearer and easier for you and hopefully to be um, more accurate in the end. So let's talk about forgiveness. Um, the loan will be fully forgiven, and I added the all if all of the funds are used for payroll costs, interest on mortgage, rent, and utilities, right? It's got to be used for the loan to be fully forgiven. You've got to spend the money on the uh, authorized expenses. Um, and again, it's only those expenses that will qualify for forgiveness. If you spend the money on other stuff, it's basically going to end up converting to a loan that you have two years to pay off, okay? 
Um, the basis of the loan right is keeping people employed. Uh, forgiveness, that second uh, sentence there on the last part, the forgiveness will be reduced. Remember what I said, if your full-time headcount or your FTEs or your salaries and wages decrease by more than um, 25% in either of those, uh, the forgiveness will be prorated because of that, okay? Um, they even said, and I think if you go back to the SBA's website right now, you'll see that additional guidance will be coming. That's the best that I can tell you is, um, again, follow up with the SBA's website, follow up with your lender, your banker, uh, whoever it is that you're dealing with. I will say, unfortunately, in dealing with Chase, I was a little disappointed while the online process itself worked really, really well. Uh, what was disappointing is that um, I cannot see my application. I cannot see the status of my application. If I go back in, it simply, and it even says, do not call us. We will not talk to you. Uh, do not email us. Um, uh, when we have information, we will email you. So to a degree, and I don't know what other people are experiencing with the other banks, um, that's a little disappointing uh, because right now I feel like my application is out there, um, you know, in some black hole. Luckily, we got ours in. Uh, last week. Uh, so I'm hopeful that, you know, we're in the running for actually getting money. Uh, again, for those of you that potentially applied in the last couple of days, uh, I don't know. You know, I don't know how quickly those things got processed through your banks and got into the SBA uh, uh, hopper before they cut off the flow. Just some answers there we don't have. All right. So the we do have a polling question here, uh, Liz. Um, how much of the loan do you expect to be forgiven? All right, good deal. So that poll question's live. We do have a lot of questions. Let's take one now while the audience is responding to this poll. Um, all right, so backing up a little bit, this, was, this question came in quite early on. Um, so the question was, is the forgivable portion of the loan treated as a grant or revenue? Um, and then this is from Jay. He must have some experience with government contracts. He says, if so, please explain the impact on overhead cost pools. Excellent, excellent question. So um, what I will say is that the uh, SBA guidelines were clear that this will not be treated as taxable income. Uh, and I'm getting some feedback. I don't know if that's from your phone, Liz. I don't, I don't know what's happened. But, uh, I'll go ahead back on mute. Yeah, sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback there. Um, excellent question. Uh, the SBA guidelines were clear that this would not count as taxable income uh, for the IRS purposes, and I think that they will stand behind that. One of the interesting things about that is typically, so there's a couple of things. Um, one, loan forgiveness outside of this program. Let me repeat that. Loan forgiveness outside of this program typically is includable in taxable income. So for example, personal or business, if you have a, um, a debt forgiveness with a bank, um, you know, and you come to some kind of an agreement with that, they're gonna issue you a 1099 and that is taxable income otherwise. This program it is not. One of the other interesting things about this is typically when you have non-taxable income or non-taxable revenue, the expenses related to that are also not deductible. That portion has not been clarified. Let me repeat, very important. Typically, when you have non-taxable income, the expenses related to that are not deductible, right? Because the government doesn't want you double dipping, right? Why would they let you get income that's not taxable and also let you then deduct the expenses that were related to it? There is not clear guidance on that yet. We think that they, that they will go around that um, because, again, the in general intent was to get money in the hands, um, kind of like the stimulus for individuals, that this was a stimulus for business. But we got to wait for further clarification on that. All right, let's get through some documentation. Uh, and Liz, I'm going to ask you, I don't know if you need to run. Um, we might go over the hour if people are willing to stick around. I don't know if you're able to do that for us today or not. Yeah, we can do that for those who would like to stay on the line. Let's just make sure that we get that fourth poll question for yeah. anyone who wants credit, and then we can hang on for some Q&A for those who would like to stick around. Definitely, we will get there. Thank you. All right, um, documentation. So the initial application, when you go into uh, your uh, lender's portal, they're going to ask for 941s, 940, 
uh, W3, that's the reconciliation of your wages that were paid for the year, your 940, 941, 944, your payroll taxes. They want to copy your corporate tax return for 2019, uh, which might be on the cusp for some of you if you haven't uh, completed that yet. There may be, and I've got a, just a generic other requested documents that they may come back and ask for. Um, internally, so you're going to want to create a separate folder. If you guys did this already, put a separate folder on your network somewhere, put copies of all this stuff out there that you submitted. Uh, I would take screenshots uh, when you applied. Um, any of that information I would put. For your internal records, you know, put a loan calculator worksheet. Whether you use ours, created your own, got somebody else's, um, whatever you used to figure out that money, keep a copy of it. Um, and a copy of income statements, other things that you use to help fill out that worksheet, payroll records, whatever you pulled. Um, you know, if you used copies of invoices, leases, bank notes, anything um, to figure out those other expenses that you included, be able to document and know how you got to that number. Um, I, I just can't stress that enough. Uh, the same is going to be true. Um, I think we've got a, for the forgiveness application, we've got a section in here on that um with documentation they've already identified that you're going to have to submit uh, information uh, documenting the number of FTEs remember full-time uh, employee equivalents uh, on payroll the pay rates that were for those periods uh, copies of payroll tax filing state income uh, unemployment insurance file anything that uh, that can otherwise verify what you paid during that eight-week period you're going to have to submit that kind of information to your bank when you apply. Um, it could be things like canceled checks, payment receipts. Again, you're caught when, when we're talking about uh, retirement benefits and health insurance and all that other stuff, make sure you keep a separate copy in this folder so that when you go to apply for forgiveness, um, that you've got it all handy and it's ready to go. Um, with that, I, I can't remember if I've got a slide in here, but let me just insert really quickly. One of the interesting things here is uh, you got six months until the first payment is due. There's deferred payment of six months uh, on this loan. The coverage period is eight weeks that begins immediately uh, when the loan is approved. Eight weeks and one day, you need to gather all your documents, do your calculations, and submit your request for forgiveness because the lenders have according to the regulations, they have to give you a determination within 60 days. So eight weeks is roughly two months. 60 days is roughly two months. That's four months. Uh, within four months, you could have a final determination on the forgiveness status of your loan and still have two months left before the first payment is due. So if you have a situation like that and maybe you end up not getting full forgiveness, it gives you a couple of months uh, even before the first payment is due to work out some of the details. And Liz, I think this is the um, uh, last polling question here for us today. All right, very good. So let's go ahead and launch this poll question. Um, did you calculate your estimated expense for the eight week period before applying for the loan? And we'll leave that open um, just for about yeah. 10 more seconds. Yeah, and I'm seeing some, and, I, and the responses I'm seeing um, are, are kind of what I thought, that it looks like we got about a third of the people who said, didn't even think about it, didn't think about, and that's the unfortunate part, and, I, and I'm not uh, uh, shaming any of you who answered that, but I think that's one of the unfortunate things about this program and the way some of those, the math worked out and the month versus weeks is that they, they tried to make it sound like it was going to be easy. I like to think that they didn't intentionally put some of these quirks in there, but unfortunately the quirks and the math are in there and I think they could come back um, and, and get some businesses in trouble. All right, and we'll take a look at those results. So it's definitely heavier toward the will meet the requirement, but like you were commenting, um, few, few folks, a good number of folks are not sure or they hadn't quite thought about that yet, but perhaps there's still time just to think about how the money's being spent at least um as far as yep. planning for those eight weeks yep well, we'll all right um yeah let's get into these accounting best practices and then uh we can uh was that, yeah that was our fourth poll so that's good so then we can do some q a as well um make sure your payroll costs are segregated in your gnl one of the things that we find with a lot of small businesses is that they have uh, a single account 
for salaries and wages and they end up dumping payroll taxes and a bunch of stuff in there. A lot of small, small companies that are on QuickBooks, oftentimes they get a report, uh, they get a check from uh, or a report from their payroll company, they enter it as a check. And if you don't do that correctly, then it, it really just messes up your books and it makes identifying what were true wages versus what were the employer's portion of taxes and stuff very difficult. So make sure you've got those accounts set up. Make sure you're entering those checks or journal entries, however you're entering it. Uh, make sure it's correct. Uh, for example, here you see, get your FICA, FUDA, SUDA separated. Because remember, FICA and FUDA is not an allowable payroll cost in terms of PPP. SUDA and local taxes would be. Uh, I'm here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, a couple of my employees are uh, in this area as well. We pay local income taxes. Right, so that's something that a lot of places don't do, but we do have that here. So if you're in a situation like that, um, make sure you've got that. Another interesting one is expense reimbursements. We've seen this with a couple of different clients recently where they reimburse employee expenses through payroll. I don't like it for many reasons. Uh, I realize some people think that it's easy. I think it actually causes more problems in the long run because again, unfortunately what happens is uh, somebody gets a report from uh, the payroll company and it says we took twenty thousand dollars out of your account to pay these employees and somebody goes and says twenty thousand dollars labor expense and they don't properly break out some of these other things and again that could be problematic in an accurate calculation uh, of your wages in order to qualify for the uh, loan forgiveness here if you haven't already please 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 contact your payroll provider uh, we've learned that some of them are doing this automatically some of them require you to make a request or to go into your side of the portal um, and do something. Uh, it's gonna vary obviously by the various payroll providers that are out there. So whether you have a direct relationship with your payroll provider, whether that's handled through your tax CPA or how you're doing that, um, contact them and make sure that your account is properly configured because they can give you reports from their side based upon the data when you get the loan and help you again properly calculate what are the uh, allowable costs. <clears throat> All right, um, if you focused on the free money aspect of the forgiveness in this and uh, not necessarily anything wrong with that, um, one of the recommendations, and we've had a conversation with a couple of clients around this is, you know, put the money in, a, or, or even if you're not necessarily going after the full free money, we saw that there were some people said, you don't necessarily need the money at the moment, but it's a nice safety net. Take that money, put it in a savings account. Maybe you can put it in a short-term CD, or something like that, and then only tap into that money when you need it. Uh, I, part of the reason I say that is because, again, with some of these quirks in the calculation, if you end up in a situation where you applied for more money than what you're able to get in forgiveness, if you don't need those unforgivable amounts, remember I showed on when I was doing my math, I showed you there was an unforgivable amount. If you end up in that situation and you have the money put aside and maybe you can just pay back that portion immediately and be done with it. And then you don't have the loan out there at all. Nothing wrong again with keeping the loan. It's a 1% loan. I mean, I don't know where you can, I don't think I could go to anybody in my family and borrow money for 1% at this point. That's a heck of a deal. It's not a bad thing to have that loan. But again, just some potential ideas um, that were out there. I already mentioned this. I'm telling you folks, eight weeks and the very next day, Make sure you start those calculations, get those documents together, and start the forgiveness application process. Um, the lenders have to decide within 60 days, uh, and you could potentially have um, all of this resolved long before your first payment is ever due. Um, one of the things that somebody, um, a question separately, and maybe somebody's got it here, we'll get to this in a second, you know, what about my credit? So the thing that I will tell you, is there's a couple of things I'll tell you about this. As long as you meet the requirements of the loan, and if you do have to make payments, as long as you make those payments, then there shouldn't be any issue with your credit. What's not clear, again, is the loan forgiveness. Typically, in a loan forgiveness situation, that is reported to a credit agent. We have not seen or heard specific guidance from uh, SBA on if banks will be allowed uh, to report loan forgiveness to credit agencies. We would hope and expect that the nature of this program, that the answer to that would be no, but we just don't know the answer to that question right now, okay? Um, 
All right, let's get to that Q&A. I know there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, Jen, I don't know if you want to jump on the line here and uh, start asking me questions. Yeah, so I heard from Jen. She has some questions um, ready to go. Um, I have visibility to audience questions as well. So okay. Jen, can you go ahead? Yeah, whoever wants to go. Jen, you want to go ahead and maybe start with a question. Robert, you can take a look through. We have had a lot of interaction with the audience. Some individuals will be able to follow up with. Some um, let's take now. But Jen, do you have a question you can get started with? Um, yes. Since the funds ran out today, should I still apply? Well, the answer to that is unfortunately you cannot. Um, the lenders won't even accept applications. So again, keep your uh, ears to the news. Hopefully um, our elected representatives in Washington, D.C. will come to a quick and uh, easy solution to this. But as of today, if you have not applied, you will not be able to apply. And I think that's kind of a segue. We heard from Clara and Clara said they applied through their bank. They're waiting for a response. Like you had acknowledged, Robert kind of entered a bit of a black hole when you did your application process. So Clara was saying they're thinking about is it possible have you heard of anyone applying at two banks and it doesn't sound like that is an option right now because the funds have run out it, but have you it, heard of anyone doing that uh so that's not even allowed uh, one of the interesting things and I, it's a great question um with the ppps you can only have one loan now does that mean that you couldn't i guess you could i suppose you could apply to two places but you know some somewhere along the way that would get caught up because you can only have one now if you have eidl um, and, and let me be clear, you could have had other EIDL loans prior to this year. Those would remain separate. In the EIDL program, you can have multiple EIDL loans. If you had an EIDL that you took out this year, you have the option to roll it into the PPP. It's not a requirement, but you have the option to roll it in there. Um, but in the PPP program itself, you can only have one loan. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a few individuals who have asked a question about, do you know how FTEs are calculated? Is it a 40 hour a week, 30, 32, 35? Is there guidance out there about that? Uh, it's typically at 40 hours a week. Um, I don't, I, I'm, I have to say at the moment, I don't know that I've seen specific uh, guidance around that in the PPP program, but, but yes, we typically look at that at 40 hours a week. Okay. Very good, very good. Um, let's see, so we had, how about, so for that loan forgiveness, just to kind of recap, does that include both the principal and the interest? Yes, that would be 100% forgiveness uh, of the loan, yep. Very good. Let's do a recap. Um, Lawrence wanted to know, does the tool on your website capture and retain the information entered so maybe we can recap how we can get that tool in the hands of everyone and how they can best use it for their companies yeah so again there's a couple of options um when you go out there you can enter the information and have it uh, uh you can print off a copy of it it doesn't save uh, you know we don't get that your name is not attached to it um in any way on our side so we don't see what that is um, if you want to download the Excel version, then that one is uh, there for you to use again. Now we do, we get your name and email address to download it, but once you've downloaded it, it's obviously on your computer and, and we don't have any access to the data that's there. Okay, very good. So then save, download it, save it, and then that way you can have probably different variations and do some modeling. That's yep. a really good cool. tool. We had a couple questions. I know that we're getting, you know, um, a bit past four. We still have a lot of people on the call, so thanks everyone for sticking around, and we'll take a few more questions if you'd like to stay with us. Um, a couple of questions about payroll expense. So one comes okay. from Stephen wondering, do bonuses count as labor? Like, could a company pay bonuses to their employees to top off labor expense? That is an excellent question and one that um, one of our clients asked us and I will tell you that it, at this point it is unclear uh, what I would, here, here's my general guidance uh, on that. One is that if the bonus would otherwise push somebody's salary above an annual, would otherwise push their annualized salary above $100,000 then it wouldn't qualify or certainly the portion that pushes them over 100000 So let's just say 
somebody made $95,000, you gave them a $10,000 bonus. Without a doubt, that $5,000 above 100,000 would definitely not qualify. What's unknown at this point is, uh, would bonuses otherwise qualify? The general um, guidance that I have seen from others in industry is to say that if you previously had a written bonus plan, that otherwise you would have legitimately made those payments during this time, then those probably still qualify. If you do all the calculations on that first day after the eight weeks and you say, I'm at 74%. And if I just gave $2,000 or whatever it was, right? If I gave $5,000 in bonuses to my five employees, $1,000 to each of them, I would magically be above the number. Could I do that? We don't have an answer to that right now. Okay. Another question on the same topic, and then a few just came in from a few folks who are on with us. We'll cover those. So three more, and then we'll um, have to take some of these offline. Um, for that $100,000, how does that impact? Um, could could it be $100,000 plus retirement expense, like the retirement benefits expense on top of that? So great question. The $100,000 is cash compensation. So that's their basic salary or wage. Um, any kind of health benefits, retirement, stuff on top of that where those funds are paid, even though they're paid on behalf of that person, uh, they're paid to somebody else, those do not qualify in $100,000. Okay. So let's say you've got an employee who makes $95,000 a year. Um, let's say they get $15,000 in uh, retirement benefits. Um, those retirement benefits do not count towards $100,000. Very good. Um, thank you. So we'll take two more questions. Um, two individuals have the same question, so this will count as one. Um, what is the eligible date for use of the funds to start using on payroll costs? So kind of what's that measurement date? Is it the approval date or is it the, is it the, the approval date? What, or the, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what we've been told is that it's the approval date of the loan. Okay. Very good. And that starts the clock ticking. Yep. All right. Last That's when your eight weeks start clicking. Last question coming in from Mark. Um, Mark's company has a line of credit and two term notes that are used for general cash flow needs. Um, they're secured by AR as well as well as building assets. Can interest on those loans be considered mortgage interest? Interesting question. Um, I, with the scenario that you've painted. Uh, I would say that the portion that is tied to the building or other physical assets probably is. So let's just say, for example, let's say you had a $500,000 line of credit and $250,000 of that was secured by a building. Um, then I would say that the, the rent, or, or sorry, not the rent, the interest expense, you know, for in that case, half of the loan. Let's, you know, so let's say you had the, the full line maxed out then I would say that portion that's tied to the building would be. Um, this is one of the tricky things with lines of credit where a lot of times a line of credit is not secured by physical property, whether it's real or personal. Um, and that part, again, has been made, what they said so far in the regulations, is that the interest has to be for something where there's a note against property, real or personal. Good, good. Thanks for taking that. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we still have a lot of people with us. I know there's a lot of questions. Um, Robert would definitely be willing to follow up. So feel free. I think that we'll cover off these next few slides. Robert, you can share your contact information and let people know how they can get in touch if they still have a question. Yeah, definitely. Again, uh, shoot us an email, support at leftframepro.com. If you've got your question already in the Q&A today, we'll get those and we'll get uh, uh, probably what I'll try to do is uh, just do uh, answers to all of them and get out to everybody um, as soon as we possibly can. You can find us on social media. You can download this on our website. Um, again, if you go to the website there, click on the answers blog. We've got additional information out there on this. Uh, we do have other events. We're a regular presenter. I think that um, uh, Liz uh, said in the beginning, and in fact, uh, we're in the middle of a 12-part 12, uh, 12 series this year on government contract accounting from end to end. We've got another um, topic coming up uh, next week, actually, 
Uh, I'm going to give a little shout out here to uh, Liz and in course, and I think she's going to jump in here as well. Um, they've been very gracious and helped us in particular with this uh, uh, webinar, getting us some timely information out to you. And with Liz, I'll let you uh, uh, talk about how your program works here. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Robert. We're really glad to be partnering with Left Brain Professionals and um, being a platform to provide this knowledge. Um, and Corsa has a um, full content library, both of webinars like this one, um, and also self-study on-demand content. So we really, like as in Corsa, we are committed to helping accounting and finance professionals um, personally and professionally through continuing education. So that's what we do. Um, and Robert, thanks for you know letting us you know, talk a little bit about that. We do have an all access pass. And so we wanted to um, just offer a code for anyone who's interested in a CPE subscription. We're really excited. Um, we're, we will be working with Robert um, and his team for the webinars that he's presented um, as part of his 12 part series. We'll be making those available as part of the all access pass. So they'll be on demand that you can learn and consume um, at your own pace. So um, stay tuned for that. That's a cool partnership that will be um, rolling out soon. So with that, we will um, also be uh, just closing with a couple of housekeeping items. There will be a short survey for you. So we'd love your feedback. Um, you can log into your course to use your account. You can get your CPE certificate in an hour. The report recording will be available later as well as the slide deck. And then Tuesday the 21st is when Robert will come back to talk about developing your first cost and price proposal. We hope you can join us. Um, and don't forget to check out um, Left Brain Professionals website for those resources that Robert mentioned, specifically that calculator. Hopefully will come in handy for a uh, next round of funding. So thanks Robert for an excellent presentation and thanks Jenny for um, all your work here in the background um, to make this possible. So we look forward to having you back on Tuesday. Thank you. Everybody have a good day. Thanks. Bye-bye.